Okay. Are you getting a call right as we're starting here? Yeah. <laughs> Hang on. I'm not going to take it. I just It's going to be the CRA scamming. I get a lot of the ones from like uh Revenue can it for ten? Yeah, that's it. See, yeah, so like, oh yeah, exactly, that's the only yeah. person who calls me. Yeah, I've never had a phone call from anyone else. Being Actually, that's investigated not investigated for fraud. Cody's called me a couple of times recently, and I've, I feel like I'm letting him down by not calling him back quick enough. I'm going to call him back after this. That was episode. like that was like the other night. Like there was a banging at my door in the middle of the night. And I had no, I thought it was like a friend who'd been out drinking, wanting to, I, you know, you don't know what to think. Then I go look off my deck and it was the police. Yeah. And they're banging on the front door. And, you know, the first thing you think, I'm, I'm just running um, down the stairs. I'm like, well, they've got me. Yeah. Well, that's. They found something. That's how we're all meant to feel in society, man. Is it was, we're all meant to feel guilty. If we felt not guilty constantly, you know, we'd question authority and power structures more than we do. But, you know, to feel guilty. Have you ever considered why the streetlights are red? We're under them, you know? And it's to stop us yeah. from, you know, talking about paranoia. And I uh, should explain that the police were not here for me, but... Uh, well, you know, it's a bit late for that. <laughs> I put it in. Prove it, buddy. Prove it. In a court exactly. of law. In a court of law. <laughs> yeah. Well, um... Speaking That's of... the jury to decide. Fuck. Speaking of paranoid, delusional, you know, themes and motifs, um, we're gonna talk about the Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young record, Deja Vu. Crosby, Stills, Nash, <coughs> and Young. Exactly. And, um, you know... doesn't roll off the tongue as well, does it? No. I still think it's interesting that they included him. We have a different opinion on this. I think it's like they were so big as a band already. You know, they'd done Woodstock. This is only our second ever gig, man. We're scared shitless. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, to con- to involve him when you're already making... $300,000 a night playing shows and be like, we're going to need to get a, get better. I think it has a lot of charm and grace and maybe some naivete, but... Yeah. Well, he was already in the band when they played Woodstock. He's on the back cover of CSN, too. <laughs> sea of Madness. Um, uh, but, no, I honestly think it was like a record company decision. Really? I think it was like that they were like, we need to make this powerhouse even more of a super powerhouse and like add. It's like not enough. It's like 60s excess. It's like Crosby, Stills, Nash was good. Throw Young in there. Maybe we'll sell an extra 100,000 records. It feels like that. And they were all just like totally down to make money. Sure. But like you can tell because like the whole thing from, from Neil's name down to the album cover seems like tacked on to it you know like you know he's not in he wasn't there for the photo he's superimposed on the cover that's a great rock and roll conspiracy i love that <laughs> that's what i heard i like it yeah i actually heard he, like, took it in front of like some truck when he was somewhere else and then just like i heard today that um at the grateful dead's 50th anniversary concert in the middle of like a 17 minute version of dark star or whatever in like whatever enormo dome stadium they played a rainbow appeared above them and everyone's going wild apparently they paid for the rainbow to be put there fifty thousand dollars for it to be created weather technology harp kind of weather technology military technology to have the rainbow put there seems like a great idea i mean i mean if you've got the money the rolling stones get like a 50 foot inflatable dick and the grateful dead get a rainbow it's what's the difference you know do you think that jerry garcia is a pagan or a pirate i think this is pretty clear pilgrim i mean this is what so we were just kind of picking up from <laughs> the last episode where we kind of un unmasked so to speak at one of the great rock and roll swindles of our time which is that there is a schism between pirate you know I pirate kind of music or pirate the lineage of piracy and then pagans and Fleetwood Mac are the only band we could think of you know in that kind of fugue state we were in trying to figure out this stuff that have both energies supplanted within their lead you know singers kind of fire and ice style so well, it's was, like as though every every band is either Beatles or Stones you know people do that well people say it's that but obviously it's but it's, it's more 
you're either pirate or pagan. And actually, as soon as I said, but or pilgrim. Yeah, and we have is Jeff. a third your friend. Yeah, we have Jeff, from, our friend, from my band from Yukon Blonde to thank for that because I was talking about this last night with him and you know in your friend. Sorry, yeah, Jeff. Yeah, yeah. I love you, buddy. <laughs> I, just have, I haven't seen him in ages. He's in Coquitlam. Yeah. Oh, well, he's right. He's right there. As, the, as though that's somewhere he's, I he's frequent. He's right here. <laughs> um, Is it Poco? Port Coquitlam? Yeah, it's great, man. They've got, we go down to Port Moody, sit on the, the beach there, and you can go swimming. You can go to uh, Renata's uh, Roti restaurant. It's been there for years. Mainstay. And uh, yeah, he lives He lives out there in a rancher. It's great. He has a little studio going on. And we were talking yesterday about this idea, this kind of theory, whatnot, of pagans and pilgrims that, well, sorry, pagans and pirates, and and he, with absolute sincerity, said, "There's a third one, the pilgrim energy." So, <laughs> in keeping with that, I made a few. I got it here somewhere. I made a few, um, and it made perfect sense to me immediately because I didn't think like Bob Dylan. I mean, Bob Dylan has probably been all three, which uh, is definitely true. But he's definitely but, got pilgrim energy. Yeah, he does. Yeah. Okay, I got a couple of guys here, so we just play pirate. Pagan. Pirate, pilgrim, or pagan? Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay, we'll start. By the way, I want to change. Jerry Garcia is definitely pagan. Yeah. The dead are way too have way too much like Illuminati, like underground cult stuff. Kyle stuff. Okay, go ahead. Don Henley, pagan. Yeah. Oh yeah, they're like a satanic. I mean, not the. <laughs> it's like Hollywood Republican. Are you kidding me? Hotel California is like pagan. F- yeah. Well, you know, and him getting caught with like two dead 16 year olds in his mom and oh was, man you know, that still hasn't been come out that's I'm waiting for that one yeah. him and david geffen yeah pagan energy for sure those yeah. guys illuminati he's got owl, no pirate you know, in him at no, all sort of like owl grove bohemian grove energy yeah okay what about linda ronstadt <clears throat> hmm yeah good one that's a good one i'm gonna say pilgrim Kind of a folky yeah, feel. Yeah, kind of a country. Folk kinda, feel. Yeah. Kind of Oregon Trail. Yeah, yeah, yeah. definitely. Okay. okay, what about Captain Beefheart? <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. That whole scene is yeah, like the pirate scene. Zappa. Uh, yeah, Zappa, uh, Tom Waits. Yeah, exactly. That whole California. Although Tom Waits crosses into Pilgrim, perhaps. Mm, yeah. I mean, I mean, he definitely he hit a point in his career. I'm going to say around um, Rain Dogs that he just went full pirate. Yeah, I think. What are you saying? Like closing time, maybe? Sure, just some kind of barroom feel good kind of. Yeah, it's still that's pirate dude. Shanty saloon, music. It's saloon, saloon music. It all it's, is. Yeah, I, it's I mean, true. come on, listen to the voice. Like, I mean, Boz Skaggs. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, uh, yeah, that's a tough one. Tough Probably one. pagan. Yeah, because it's like sleazy. Yeah. So sleazy is pagan. Yeah, sleazy is pretty pagan, yeah. Grace Slick. Oh, pagan for sure. Yeah. Jeff Lynn. Ooh. Tough one. Pirate? That one's tough. I think pirate. Yeah. Yeah, he's frilly, got the look. Frilly got shirt. The, the cello. Yellow, yeah, and, the hair. Yeah. For sure. Barry Gibb. <laughs> pirate. Pirate energy? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> For sure. Disco is pirate, I guess. Kind Studio of. 54, kind of dressing up. Yeah. Yeah. Show, showmanship. Showmanship, yeah. Um, Bruce Springsteen. Well, he, he, as you said, he commercialized pirate. He unionized music. the pirates. He unionized He's, the pirates. He just, yeah. he brought them onto land to work on the ships. Right. Yeah. Right. He's an everyman. And uh-huh. that's kind of. He wants to think he's a pilgrim. Y- interesting. But he's a pirate. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, what about if we do the same thing? We could, I, mean, I could just fucking do this for an hour, really. Well, this is we should let what about our, David Crosby. Our listeners can ask us. And we'll be we'll be happy to answer any if you have any artists that you'd like to know whether they are a pilgrim, a pirate, or a pagan. Just yeah, and just go ahead and Holler throw out. it on our Holler Instagram out. account, yeah. and we'll be sure to uh, answer any time of day or night. Yeah. Well, um, what about David Crosby? Well, I think that yeah, that he again he would like to think he's pilgrim, but he's pagan. I think he's pagan. Yeah, he is. The but he wants and... to like he wants to be Dylan. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like he want he wants to be. I mean, man, Crosby is like it's weird. I've gone full circle. Like I listened to Deja Vu today, 
And he was kind of the only one that I was like, weirdly, uh, that I could handle yeah. listening to the album. That I was like, because he just seems like he's like the only one that like actually has any legitimate soul on it. Like the rest of them have this like vibe of. They kind of a they're wizened youth vibes. Like they're all how like I was cracking up listening to four twenty four and twenty. Oh man, he's, he's that's how old he is. Okay, let me. Can I just give you yeah. a quick little my take on that song, which is just listening. That basically like he's talking about how his father was like a poor door to door working class man. Yeah, and. Then the the best line he says a different kind of poverty now upsets me, me so. soul yeah <laughs> kind of a pirate vibe me soul <laughs> I thought it was well whatever but I, me, I, so, me so me so me so but but me so the best thing he's like he's like yeah he's like because I'm fucking loaded yeah. It's a different kind of poverty. Basically, he's lonely. Yeah. That's what the song's about. Yeah. Like, my father was a working class man. He's like, but even though I have all, I'm a multi-millionaire yeah. at 24, he's like, you know, you still should kind of feel a little bit of sympathy for me. Well, I'll go further with it's that. Ridiculous. Because I was thinking about the song Almost Cut My Hair. That's some real fucking first world problems. <laughs> yeah, like, exactly. worrying about <laughs> cutting my hair, but I didn't, you yeah. know? And then it continues, because he's like... He owes it to, like, what, future generations? That oh, he he's... owes it to basically, like, all his millions of fans. To keep his like, hair long. follow him. You've seen what he looks like in that period? He should have fucking cut his hair, <laughs> quite frankly. Well, he didn't have much hair. Yeah, exactly. So he had... He Maybe wanted... it's just about baldness and the feeling yeah, of going bald as opposed so. to being, like, some kind like of counterculture like icon. Times, really. It's really funny because the second verse, yeah. he says he had a... A cold at Christmas. I had the flu for Christmas. Yeah, yeah. and it inc- that that feeling increases his paranoia. <laughs> it sounds like the kind of person you know, like who complains about everything. Yeah, well, exactly. And then Stills on four and twenty. By the end of the song, he says, "And I find myself wishing that my life would, would simply cease." cease. <laughs> He's like. He wants Simply. to be dead. Yeah. Like, that's that's how hard it is for <laughs> to, him. Because he's not getting laid. Yeah. Well, yeah. Well, he's probably getting laid, but, like, his soul isn't kind of being fulfilled. I embrace the many-colored beast. The many-colored beast. <laughs> <laughs> what a crock of what shit. What a fucking guy. 24 years old. 24 years. Wizened youths. Yeah. Just, just wise beyond their years. Yeah. Imagine Neil putting up with that bullshit. That's, well, that's what I'm saying. There's evidence... This is like another conspiracy, although definitely more directly posed, that if you listen to the album, James, there is evidence all over the album that Neil just doesn't give a shit. Fuck, yeah. Like all over in his guitar playing, I'll take the solo and almost cut my hair first yeah. off. Stills wanking for about four minutes, and then Neil just comes in with one shearing note. <laughs> And like hardly does anything. It's like two notes. It's louder than stills. And he's just kind of like, I'm just going to do this and then just kind of check out for the rest. Like, and then he decides to throw. He's just like, he's like, you know what, though? I'll put the best song on the whole album. I'll give you I'll do this one and I'll just kill it. And then I just like will kind of be absent the entire rest of the time. It's a solo song. They're barely on it. Like they're barely there. I read that they are. He made them stay up into the night until they were all exhausted and didn't want to play it anymore. And then he got the take. Presumably, some of them sitting out, you know, and he right. got the take then because he's like, I can't do it with these fucking cokeheads yeah. around playing at twice the speed I need them to. And the other song of his on the album just sounds like a Buffalo Springfield throwaway song. Yeah, or something off his first record. Yeah. yeah. Like, when he was interested in chords, weirdly. Yeah. yeah. That early. It, Buffalo Springfield Clancy can't even sing through into like the old broken laughing, arrow yeah old laughing lady yeah 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 and yeah. where he's kind of doing like it's not as good when he does that though who's the guy who um I like his more who's pa- the guy? I like his more pilgrim records than pagan ones for Neil yeah, big time yeah yeah <clears throat> but who's the guy his like or- orchestral buddy. Oh, In, Jack Nietzsche. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah. like the kind of that's like Jack Nietzsche's influence. Yeah, I of think, course. Yeah, is which like, is which is groovy in its own way, you know. But you know, I was thinking <clears throat> with Helpless when I was listening to it that I remember these kind of things come. To, I honestly re-listening to these records, I feel like I'm like on the spectrum because it just reminds me of so many memories like come through. 
things I've not thought about for years. And I remember thinking that the song was like, sort of implicitly, I thought it was some kind of like lament about the way in which technology can impact your ability to write poetry. And I think I thought he was talking literally about Big Bird from Sesame Street. Flying across the proverbial sky. That's psychedelic. Yeah. Only and, the mind of a child could yeah, envision such I think such I a thing. thought this until I just listened That's to it right cool, now. I was though. like, I used to think that this was about Sesame well, Street. Well, Neil was a very like visual, visceral lyricist, I feel like. He he gave you those kind of, you know, I just see the pictures, man. Yeah. You know, that, you seen that interview? He's like, I just smoke a joint, man. And then I just <laughs> see the pictures in my mind, you know? Um, can I tell a quick story? Yeah. Because I thought about this, I think I've told you, but I just want that when I was 18, I went and saw Crosby, Stills, Nash at the Pacific Coliseum here in yeah, Vancouver. Yeah. And I understand you were at the I was, show, uh, yeah, yeah, didn't was, know uh, you. Yeah. Really excited, came over with some friends from Victoria. And we all, as you do at that age, ate a large bag of magic mushrooms and went into the show. And I'm sitting in the audit, in the, in my seat and, you know, they start coming over me and I start getting really high and it's bad. It's really bad. The concert starts, I'm tripping balls. Like, it's horrible. The light, fantastic. Yeah, tripping the light, fantastic. So I start, I say, I gotta go to the bathroom. I somehow make my way to the bathroom, go into the stall, take all of my clothes off. I'm dripping sweat. Like, it's so bad. And I'm like, I'm here. We're staying in a hotel. I'm gonna ruin the whole concert. It's over. I'm sitting there about to have a panic attack and all of a sudden, a sound wafts in through the bathroom it's the opening chords of guinevere nice and all of a sudden you know as as it happens yeah. this other feeling come over me i was like joy everything is beautiful everybody i love you kind of thing yeah and i go out i splash water on my face with my clothes on walk out there's blue light all through the pacific coliseum and just crosby and nash on the stage yeah. on two stools and boy, I sat there and just, it was the best concert of my they life. They loved you out of it. They, I had a couple of friends love me out of it, yeah. David and Graham. Yeah. yeah. That's amazing. It was beautiful. First time I saw Crosby, Stills and Nash um, was in Manchester and I was living, I was like 19, I was living with my friend, Paul, and uh, he bought these deck shoes, like these kind of deck style, like sailor style deck shoes. Yeah, they're kind of like the ones you're wearing. Mm -hmm. And um at the time, it was like we were trying. We were like dressing up like cowboys and stuff, like trying to look like it was the seventies. So we were going to see them. It was an, a winter's day, and um, we walked. We were we were in city centre, and we were walking towards the Bridgewater Hall, which actually is really near the Midland Hotel. Where when we later on, Graham Nash said was where he wrote Military Madness. Sat on the steps of the Midland Hotel, which is also where my parents spent their honeymoon that evening after they got married it's a really nice hotel mm -hmm. it was actually going to be uh it's a like neoclassical building and uh hitler had it pinned as like where he wanted to have his base in the north of england <laughs> wow. if, if and when he won the war that and rochdale town hall but um yeah we were gonna go and see so we went to this pub called the thirsty scholar if i remember right or maybe peveril of the peak it's right in the city center and as we were walking towards the Bridgewater Hall, Paul was wearing his deck shoes and he slipped on ice really badly and smashed his head on the floor. Like, it was like visibly bad, you know, like yeah. a massive thing. And as this happened, two guys walked past us and I was like, Jesus. And they looked at him and they just said, serves you right, you faggot, for wearing deck shoes. So I had to pick him up <laughs> and drive him to hospital. But I really wanted to go to the show. So I dropped him off at the hospital and he was kind of a bit faint and then he was going to get seen to. I think it was with maybe a couple of other friends. So I missed the start of the show, but he was like, you've got to go and watch it. You know, don't, don't worry about me. And when I got there, I got there. I must have missed like Carry On or something because they opened with that. But when I got there, I got there just in time, similarly to what you're saying, to the kind of like Graham and David like kind of medley kind of a four-way street style medley so i got there just in time for the, the lee shore oh yeah into guinevere yeah that's what yeah. that's what really it was. nice yeah. that's what it was at mine yeah. as well yeah. yeah they must have done that for about 15 years <laughs> yeah and then i remember david crosby telling a story about how graham um was his best friend and uh that he was lucky that he had the when he was in his kind of the halcyon days of like freebasing cocaine even so much so that he had like a gas mask 
kind of like blue velvet style. Dennis Hopper, blue velvet style, gas mask of like noxious cocaine because he could his nose didn't work anymore. His septum and his veins, yeah, were and everything blue. was shot. That Graham had the wisdom at that at that moment to and the foresight just as a friend to say, David, I think you've done enough. You've gone now. too far, yeah, and that's that he loved him out wow. of it. You know, that's kind, kind to have a friend. How old do you think? They were in relation to each other. Still, it's still much younger than Crosby and. Nash. I think Nash is a bit older because he was in the Hollies, Hollies, and they. I mean, but they could have been sixteen or something. I don't know when he was doing a car on a carousel and all that. And um, I'm a big Hollies fan. What's the really nice Holly song? Um, the bow. Supposed to be in a bus stop. Bus stop. Yeah. I never liked that, like that one. Eh. You know what I was thinking? Bus stop, what days you let us say. It's, you know kinda, it's a bit too, like, I don't know. Do you know what I was thinking of yesterday? It was making me laugh for some reason. Dave Clark. Because I'm tsh, tsh, glad all over. I love Dave Clark. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's Knocked, great. I want to hold your hand off. Because I love you. <laughs> and it knocked, uh, uh, I want to be a man off the top of the charts, that song. Yeah. And also, you know, he's really rich. Oh, he, yeah. he took all the publishing. Singing drummer. Yeah, singing drummer. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Not many. Just, Don Henley. Just, yeah, yeah. Leave on. Leave on. Dave Clark, though, band leader, singer, and drummer, kind of cool. Yeah, there aren't many. It's true. Because, you know, in the Eagles, obviously, Glenn Fry would say he's the band leader. Yeah, I mean, not. He, he's dead now, <laughs> isn't he? So Don yeah. Henley can write, rewrite that history if he wants. It's it must. Like, do you not think with the Eagles, it must be tough? Because like, Don Henley's like, He's got the voice. Yeah. Uh, Glenn Fry like, must have just fucking resented No, it. he loved it because he saw the... He, it was almost like he, he fully used that voice to his advantage. Do you see the documentary where that, the, the poor guy who wrote Victim of Love, like the other guitar player? And he like loved it. He's like, I stayed up all... <laughs> Listen to this. He stayed up all night writing Victim of Love. He's like, went in, we cut the track sounded amazing then they were like yeah why don't you go for lunch man and they went and i came back and dawn and cut the song and they were just like sorry man nothing you can do about it <laughs> and then glenn flyer they, they were asking him about it and he was like he's like hey if you had a voice like that in your band you would have done the same i'm like i don't i'm not so sure it's a great documentary bbc documentary. victim of love wick is is a super sleazy eagle song disco though. strangler that takes the fucking cake on sleeves. Well, that's, I mean, that's at the point that pretty much everything they did was like the like musical version of free basing cocaine yeah. in a mask. You yeah. Know. It's, there's a really good documentary, a BBC documentary from years ago. I've not seen it since I was like there. So, like, you know, 15, 16 years ago, about, it's called From the Birds to the Eagles. Mm. And it's about the, the, like, I suppose the, the relocating of the great American songwriting tradition from Tim Pan Alley to the confessional version, the Joni, Ladies of the Canyon. Cos- cosmic Country. Yeah. And then how the Eagles took it all Just and shit all over shit. it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And it's like this amazing footage of them like playing like witchy woman <laughs> in like, you know, the troubadour and stuff and yeah. like everyone being there and yeah, just being this just like adopting of but i think you hear that even on csny i think you hear them like trying to do what neil's doing authentically and i wonder if they really genuinely when they invited him in the band there's i've heard interviews with cross crosby saying like you know stills wanted neil in a band from the buffalo springfield days you know probably because he was still so jealous he was like he wanted a chance to like compete with them one on one or maybe that but i mean crosby said that me and graham were like not particularly we were a bit nonplussed because we're like we're doing really well you know and then they got neil in just to hang out like at mama cass's or some bullshit and he played them helpless and it was like crosby said that's the best song he'd he'd heard that like you know they were like in a room with like this guy was this guy was playing chess you know but he was like most people play chess on the board this guy was just 14 steps ahead you know oh my and God. he completed seven of them and he's just so far ahead of us let me ask you this because like do you think crosby stills nash like basically because they were so big like are responsible for all of that 70s like the bridge uh, like am kind of folk rock like 
like that because they were so massive that and I like a lot of that music but like there is a whole river of shit in there that was huge and you know like bread and bands like that I, I like bread yeah you gotta but, say you like bread Alex yeah. is over there <laughs> I like bread but you know Dan Fogelberg this kind of thing the what like bloated you- like uh kind of rock star turned folk like was did they create that in the way that McCartney created like ballot rock and roll balladry because oh. you can directly trace like all of that, like you know, like um, all by myself, Eric Carmen, all the way through to sure. like November La- Rain by Guns N' Roses, yeah, to Let, Let It die. Be, yeah, yeah, you can't say like, to Hey Jude, yeah, yeah. to Hey Jude, yeah. So in this, in that way, to, were Crosby, Stills, Nash responsible for the that easy uh, listening, easy like listening, guitar based yacht rock, almost so, like folk, yeah, yeah. Maybe like the cleanliness of their harmony structure. Yeah. You know, like That's bands like of... Toto would probably really like exactly. them. Exactly. Yeah. That stuff. Yeah. Yeah, maybe. I mean, definitely not Neil Young. No. So just them three. Yeah. I mean, they they veer dangerously close to that stuff in the mid 70s themselves. Yeah. With like Shadow Captain. Oh, things yeah. Like Shadow Cat Pirates. It's funny. I was looking through my LPs today of Crosby Stills and I was like, I was like, cool, I've got. The first, I've got the first album, I've got Deja Vu, and I've got this one. Yeah, that one, that's the one. Self-titled. This one's, this one's great. CSN. Yeah, this has got Shadow Cap, it's got, it's got, um, it's got Cathedral on it, or it's got an... See the changes, carried away. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's got... It's a little worn out here. It's uh, a great record. A couple of the, couple of the hits it's, are kind it's, of faded It's a great here. record, but yeah, it's, I mean, it's... Let's see here. That's where they turned full pirate. Oh, this one does this have this has Dark Star on it? When he's like, This oh. song's a burst. I don't care. <laughs> yeah. This is a good one. Like where he thought that he could write a better song called Dark Star than the Grateful Dead. It's amazing, eh? Yeah, maybe that I mean, what's he thinking? It's, he, I, it's really hard to this tell. Is, they're probably all it might be like a post recovery record you yeah know? It's like, it seems back. like that they're out on the boat they're like we're getting ourselves together we're getting it's probably mus- Crosby's boat mus- of course it it's is it's probably oh, the yeah. boat that he bought with his severance package from the birds after he wrote Dolphin's Smile mm-hmm. and like stop hey what no that's not that song the other one like that he wrote come on get together uh, try to all that bullshit off for what it's notorious worth notorious birds brothers now oh oh yeah 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 you know, whatever what, just Dolphin some hippie, Smile well I mean that's a good one <laughs> free energy triad triad that was he the one that got did, him yeah. in trouble triad got him in trouble for being the menage a trois angle but he loved that Fucking then he did it, it like live every did, single show he's like, i think he did it when i saw him basically Just solo though. the most cutting edge song ever written yeah it's about me graham and Joni. his dad was like a massive hollywood movie producer Hey really? Crosby, I didn't know like, that. Oh yeah, like like Hollywood Hills, like had parties when he was a teenager, like, full on Silver Spoon, born into the scene, a rock uh, and roll kid, so whatever, showbiz kid, mm-hmm. yeah. So when you when you see the excess that he grew into, it makes a whole lot of sense. Yeah. Even though, like I say, <laughs> at the time I was kind of like, oh no, you know, Stills is the because you know when you're younger, you you really fall in love with the people who are with the egos in rock and roll and the people who are like doing all the work. I was like, oh, Stills is playing keys and sure. guitar, and you're like, but now that shit kind of pisses me off. Yeah, and I just like the Crosby's kind of like this energy guy. Barely can write a lyric. Yeah, barely, barely can write a song. Barely, right? Yeah, he's, he's, it's but also he benefits from the fact that like. When he takes center stage, then he has these like this like repertoire of musicians around him, like stills on his tracks. Uh-huh. Whereas like Crosby on stills tracks, I don't know like what you get that middle harmony, I, which is worth which a, is it's probably worth everything. you could argue the most important thing uh, of the group. Uh, in, it's kind of kind of a yeah. Kermit. Uh, da, 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 da. It's kind of a Kermit feel. Yeah, yeah, but it's a nice Kermit. Yeah, it's a good. It's like a positive thing you know it's a it's a frequency range thing yeah you know like that famous quote we love that graham was like he's like you know we don't we don't have we don't own music and we don't own those chords but when those three voices got together like something new was created (laughs) (laughs) yeah it's good 
Are you gonna? I'm have, gonna crack. You gonna crack here? Yeah, we're at we're at the half. I mean, look, we're at the halfway point here. So, I actually we need to go for a run. I try and get primed and pumped up before the pod, but I uh, I didn't this time because I didn't have time. So I'm drinking a zero percent alcohol beer. Mm. You see, um, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, say you can't talk off my nose. No, just open your open your paps. The thing about that that puzzles me is that so it's for you it's all like placebo because I think I'd have trouble pumping after I crack even if it was zero percent because I'd feel like I had the beer. Mm. Whereas yours, yours, just the lack of alcohol is enough to. I'm planning on I'm planning on busting out a 10k. I might even ride drive my car to Stanley Park and run around the park. And I just don't think I could do that after a kokanee. That's nice. I, I, I did the thing the other day. It was like you said where I had to go pick up my car at the mechanic. Yeah. And I was like, well, I don't want to take the bus. You know, it's COVID. I don't have a car. I can't take my bike because then I can't get my bike home. I don't know what I'll do. So I was like, oh, I'll run there. Thinking it's like miles away because it's not. Yeah. And then it turned out it was only five kilometers. every time I go over to... Graham's if I leave my car there It's mm-hmm. desperately short It's depressing when you But it, I was like prepping for it As yeah. though it You're was like Farrah. the like, journey I was Farrah, going yeah, I was yeah. like Alex I can't like What should yeah, I take? Yeah what yeah. do I do? You know what I mean? That was like It's like half the distance I would normally run If I was going to go on a run it Yeah It weirdly felt, felt longer though I mean perspective man It's complicated I think when we Get through the simple, you know, the sort of the the real kind of cornerstones of classic rock music. It'll be really fun to explore the subsequent records, the kind of family tree records of each of these scenes. I don't know, like Manassas Records or like St- Stills One <laughs> with Hendrix on it. I think it's even Hendrix's last ever live record like recording last ever recording session i mean we could just do a podcast only on like crosby stills nash and young offshoot records if you want but or which one's the worst one long may you run (laughs) stills young band that's really bad really bad yeah i do like the song long may you run but i don't like stills's contribution (laughs) to it like i mean i he barely could speak it's (laughs) He barely could speak by that point because the same stuff. Mm-hmm. He just did. They'd, they'd done too many drugs. He had a kind of weird horse racing energy. Well, he's got that one album. Thoroughfare Gap, I think it's called. <laughs> he's kind of, and then he's kind of a jockey kind of vibe, like a Southern Belle. I think he he was so delusional, man, that he thought he was like an athlete, like a pro athlete and a pro musician. He actually there's did, that episode he's yeah. got he's got the football yeah. jersey on. Yeah, he also thinks that he's maybe Central American at some point. Yeah, because of his like all the percussion, C- Cuban, the Cuban kind of feel. Yeah, yeah. Well, there's a bunch of parts on songs where he's kind of singing like. Not in like broken Spanish, yeah. like Spanglish, Spanglish sort of yeah. like on the Manassas record. Manassas, yeah, he really kind of. I feel bad for Chris Hillman on that Manassas record because Hillman was the guy. He like he never got any credit for the scene. He he kind of is the guy in that scene, like in the Cuban Manassas. No, in the Birds, oh, like yeah. he he Burrito Brother. Mm-hmm. He's the only guy who went Birds Burrito Brothers into the Crosby Stills Nash scene. He's the only one that kind of did. He did the folk psychedelia. He did the con- Cosmic Country, and then he did the Coke, uh, Coke like, Rock. Yeah, he's the only one who did all three. Yeah, well Crosby. But Crosby didn't didn't do country. He didn't do the cosmic country. Well, that wasn't it. Because he left before they did Sweetheart of the Rodeo, the birds. Yeah, he was out before He went that. straight from, from he went folk from, psychedelia. He went electric, though. Yeah, folk psychedelia. Folk psychedelia straight but to he didn't coke do, rock. He didn't do... Yeah, he missed out on the, the psychedelic cowboy country. Yeah. You know, Which is like kind of the coolest part of that whole scene. It was I think. the first birds record I ever got. I got it from HMV when it was like I had Christmas, like, you know, a gift card. And I was, you know, probably like 15 and I went into town and got like a book. I don't actually remember any of the other CD. It was on CD at the time. So I hadn't even started buying records yet. And it was like Sweetheart of the Rodeo because someone had said you should you should get into the buzz. I remember being like 
kind of like really disappointed because I thought they were going to be like an electric folk band. And, but then like at that period and the way that you kind of immerse yourself in music, I still just listen to it nonstop. So like, that's the record that I know the best maybe. Yeah. But I, then, you know, I was, I think I was trying to buy Notorious Bird That's Brothers. just like, yeah, that's just really? like anything. I bought the Guess Who Greatest Hits and like, I tell you every fucking note on it now, you know, cause I just like bought the CD at AMB Sound in Victoria and listened it to was, it. was, uh. You know, my first girlfriend, she was real mean. She didn't like the Guess Who and we were driving in my car one day and she took the CD out of the thing and threw it out the window. Can you believe that? That's awful. It was really hurtful when I look back on that. I think I'll t- I I have a line to Randy Bachman. That was the Bachman. first CD I ever bought with my own money. Yeah, that's toxic. Yeah. Yeah. That's toxic. Can I say something else? This is a real like you a can seg- speak. You segue. Can, this is a safe space. I, I know that I don't even know if this will be relevant, but I just want to say, you know what really upset me last night? There were, I, I don't like to get political on this show. Yeah. But how obsessed everybody got with the fly sure. on Mike Pence's head. Yeah. And that's what pisses me off more than anything about the internet yeah. is like how everybody was just salivating at about how clever rotting. they thought they were. Yeah, rotting that they're like, oh my God. Yeah. Like it's just like that they're like, I can make a meme about this. Yeah. Like I can contribute something to the internet. And it's like, no one's talking about anything that anybody said. They just think that this fly is hilarious. They're like, Oh, fly. There was yeah. a fly on his head. Like, yeah, people just, I mean, the world is, it's over, right? Yeah. It's, Everything's done. So there's nothing else to do other than it's joke. Just like, and all, you it's know, a goddamn impossible way of life. You like know. people are like, like made, whoever made the meme was like Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Yeah. Like I sent the fly. Yeah. It's like, think they're so smart. Yeah. And it's I'm like, so sad. It's a fly landed a f- on the guy's head. Yeah. Like really, this is where we're at. This is like world entertainment for the world now. Yeah. I mean, I guess that's, that's all. But it's even worse because it's people left. like us. It's like it's like younger. Well, it's not people like us because well, I'm not no, doing that. I'm. I, I. I can't. I can't even watch that stuff. I mean, but you know, like this is kind of what people find funny. Well, now. listen, man. You know, just remember that they have more in common with each other than they do with us up there on that stage, man. You know, politicians, the man. You know, they're well, the man, and we got to fight the man. Like full circle. Has Crosby tweeted anything Crosby's, about the debate last night? Crosby is. He's. One of the he is like epitomizes the problem when you leave old people with a Facebook account to just kind of <laughs> figure out what that shit means. Like he's popped out of the rabbit hole, kind of somewhere on the correct side, the progressive side, but it's m- mental the stuff that he says on there, you and know. The, the and he's an angry man, you know. It'll be like. And you can bait him with questions. You can ask him anything. Hey, Cross, like, did you ever meet Lou Reed? What do you rate him as a songwriter? And he'll write back. Yeah, don't rate him. The 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 best part too is that somehow that stuff, like those guys being on Twitter and stuff, has like severed their relationships with one another. Yeah, like because like he tweeted that stuff about Daryl Hannah You're being a te- she's tempted us all. Yeah, she's and, a now, and now, to, now she's a tempstress. Like Neil won't talk to him. It's like yeah. no, no, it wasn't the like forty years of abusing drugs and, no. and ruining your relationship as a touring group. It was this tweet. It's yeah. It's and also. Um, he like, like insulted flack files and Neil's you don't like, you don't want these yeah well fuck I mean talk about letting down the team I mean Neil is just oh perpetually like give me a break whether it's you know standing in front of a Confederate flag or being like Bezos's pony boy you that know Amazon what I mean? ad oh, oh my god, god. What a joke you know but you know I'm <laughs> talking mean, about how flack files make you hear the drum better on better. country girl or whatever yeah, like as david briggs intended when it is shot yeah out, haven't you, know? you haven't heard it right you haven't heard tonight the first tonight, 16 well different record, releases yeah. and masters yeah, yeah. <clears throat> it's well, an absolute joke I, yeah i mean i it you know that's why kirk bain killed himself that's why who did kirk bain killed himself he didn't want to he didn't want to be he, he, his legacy's intact same with Hendrix. Yeah. These people's legacies intact. They saw. They saw. They Jim saw Morrison what too. Becoming an irrelevant joke uh-huh. is like, and in you know, and is like just time is so painful. Yeah, there is nothing you know you can do other than become an irrelevant joke, and it's been, it's more rapid now because 
older people have access to the internet. They shouldn't be allowed. They shouldn't have access. It's like we had Facebook in like, you know, our teens and our parents were like looking over our shoulders being like, what is this? And we just kind of like said, I don't know, have a go on it. And then now you have QAnon. Yeah. That's what happens. Yeah. Like Crosby thinks he's that like he is capable of sending like a pod of orcas to guide Greta Thunberg safely back across the Atlantic and stuff. Well, it uh, it's a sad thing really. Like it does only amplify delusions as you get older. Yeah. Like people think that they, you know, that you know, people that they meet on the internet are their friends and stuff like that. Yeah, Even I younger mean, people. And everyone takes everything far too seriously. It's like how every you know, time the CRA calls, calls you, up. you answer because you hope that it's a real person and not just a recording. Because that's all I've got. I'm telling you, I, I'm not lying about this, man. Like, this pandemic, like, I'm lonely, you know? I go down to the pool, the aquatic center. There's a guy there, Bruce, who checks me in. Bruce, I eh? like to try to have a little conversation with him. Because that's saying? the only pr- human contact I'll have all day, and I know that. Yeah, and what do you think's like? What's Bruce's take on like CSNY? I'd love to know. Uh, he seems <laughs> he's got a bit of a pirate vibe. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he's hanging around an aquatic center. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah. He did tell me about the dive tank. It's the a dive secret. tank. Yeah. If you don't like the lanes, if it's too crowded, he said, just go over to the dive tank. There's usually There's nobody a tank? over there. Well, it's like it's like a, a really pool. deep pool. Yeah. Because they got the ten the ten meter diving board there, and it's a big this pool is big enough pool. Not really. It's like eighteen meters. It's not good. So, hang on a second here. Okay, I'm looking at the cover here because I want to see. So you, you think, know what else I thought about this? Yeah. The piano playing sucks on this album. The whole record. Yeah. It's probably Stills just yeah. feeling himself. It sucks. Like. It's it's really I'm like they should have hired how they got the Greg Reeves and Al Del- Cooper or something. They, they he played with he used to play with Al Cooper, right? Is he on there? And I'm just totally <laughs> bowing this. No, um, it's like Nicky Hopkins or something. I'm gonna tell you right now. I mean, interesting that Jerry Garcia plays the mouth harp on Deja Vu. I assumed that I that was, was Neil. Neil kind of old furry sings the blues. Another style. example of he just was not he's not on any of these tracks, dude. Okay, let's have a look at the credits. Do you know here. that do you know James that they were like Oh no it's not. Sorry, it's John Sebastian. The <laughs> From Steel the Love and Spoonful. Yeah. The steel guitar on Teach Your Ch- Children is Jerry. Oh yeah, that makes that's sense. cool. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Who actually. wrote "Teacher Children"? Is that, that a Nash song? That's a Nash song. It's so funny again. It's like so like these wizened youths, like so earnest. Yeah, like you know, like my dad loves my us. father's hell will surely go by or health or something. I Teach don't know. your children health. well. Their father's health. No one's ever known the lyrics because it's a crock of shit. What else have we got here? Let's see. <clears throat> John Sebastian, Love and Spoonful. I'm a fan of that group. Uh, John, just as well, quick counter, like a little point here. Jerry, Jerry Garcia and John Sebastian, courtesy of Warner Brothers. Of course. Yeah. Do you know that, do you know that, James, that they tried to put out a greatest hits? Like around, like after they did this one and like another album and they tried to, and, and they asked Neil and he was like, no way. It's all like all my songs. Brilliant. It was like three years later and they hadn't written any new ones because they were all drugged out and Neil had been like contributing in like Ohio. He was like putting out singles as the group. You this, know? this is interesting. Actually, I've never read the line is here. Every so it says that you've got the you have look at this for egos. As if you didn't know this shit already, like from listening. It's like, side one, carry on, Stephen Stills. Like it tells you, like yeah. the writer. And then, in parentheses, their own publishing houses. Yeah. So it's Stephen Stills, Gold Hill Music. Graham Nash, Teach Your Children, Giving Room Music. Almost Cut My Hair, David Crosby, Gorilla Music. This guy's like Zach Delaro. You know, it's just, okay. And then, Neil Young. Helpless, broken, broken arrow. arrow. Yeah, okay. And then we've got Joni Mitchell, of course, the writer of Woodstock. Sick home music, if that's how you pronounce it. Amazing. Our house. <clears throat> you know what happened? I was a big Stills fan. And Ooh, then- this is interesting. There's a lot of there's a lot of stuff on Country Girl, like a lot. 
Oh, it's because it's... What the hell's going on here? Country girl, Neil Young. I love this. Sorry, folks. Uh, I know some of you may think that we should have learned about some of this No, look at this. It's very interesting. James has got the LP wide open here. Well, listen, uh, this is an extremely professional podcast. You know, and you know, I take music very seriously, well, we've and I take about, art very seriously. We've talked about this before. We're not looking to win any awards on content, purely on audio quality and riffing. Yeah, riff. I, so this is kind of a. It's, listen, I'm riffing here. It's yeah. what I'm best at. So country girl. Neil Young, and then they kind of break it down into three sections because this is when well, it is three sections. Yeah, so it's Whiskey Boot Hill is the first section, oh, and these all have different. Um, these have different publishing houses. Some of these, so Whiskey Boot Hill is Ten East Publishing, and then track, uh, the second section is Down 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 is Ten East and Broken Arrow. And then three, Country Girl, I think you're pretty, is just Broken Arrow Publishing. What's 10 East? I don't know. Got to look is it there up. a co-writer? No. Well, there must be if there's a second. Either that or Neil just had all these publishing houses and this paperwork is ju- was... This is Geffen just knowing how to make money, isn't it? Y- look, I, I this, had a... this is what this is. It's Geffen well, exactly. being like, let's have these fritty shell organizations. And some poor like assistant who's having to do like m- mountains of paperwork about all this. Yeah. <clears throat> um, but you know what I was thinking is that I love Stephen Stills. And then I read Shaky. And that, which is, and now I'm putting this all together, man. Okay. That, that was just like, it's Neil's book, and yeah. it really paints stills in a really bad light. It does. I thought it's un- unfortunate, actually. Yeah. And, and now I'm like, maybe I gave him, give him a bit of a bad rap because of that. But the, the things in it that are the worst to me are, talk about ego, how there's two stories of him hanging out with Bob Dylan and with Paul McCartney. Kind and of the, like a pilgrim and a pirate. Yeah. Well, McCartney's pure pagan to me, but pure pagan yeah um but no no the story you know that he he locked himself in a hotel room with bob dylan and bob dylan played him blood on the track start to finish and graham nash was outside listening because he was like this is amazing this is like the greatest thing i've ever heard and dylan left and and stills was just like yeah like you know he's a he's a he's a good lyricist but he's no songwriter (laughs) (laughs) just like so and graham was like in the book he's like that's when we knew like Stephen had a problem. Had a yeah, and like Brilliant. they were jamming in a hotel room with Paul McCartney, and Paul had his Hofner, and Stephen just like coked out, just said to him, "He's like, we got to get you a better bass, man." Oh, like can you you know those guys? Yeah, who would say shit like Jocks. that? That they're like, you're like, oh, dude, because you get given like a brand new P bass. Yeah, yeah, that yeah. You're, you think you're gonna tell? Well, it's also just just the massive jocks. insecurities like jock, jock energy insecure. yeah jock energy like jockey jockey plus like quarterback yeah you know the he worst. has a patriot energy he does like well, yeah. you know he's a brady a, he's kind he, of a he's probably a hollywood republican now I don't stills know. yeah 100 percent. that's maybe what you maybe that's I mean? the real you issue think, it's like you don't think paul mccartney has the, like this is also it's sad the drugs yeah. you don't think He's Paul got McCartney this one under control. knows about other bases yeah. <laughs> like he like it's not like the Beatles were trying to be given gifts of every fucking base in the world and he, he probably tried them all but he liked the Hofner and it does have a sound you so know? what makes them so successful do you think what is it the harmonies I think it's that's just, all it is it's just it's a, new, it was a new thing. Me. It's the way their voices sound together. Yeah, the three-part harmony was a new thing. And that came, that was like, obviously the Beatles did it on songs and moments, but it was like, like, you know, you're talking about like uh, that song, Everybody I Love You, yeah. and like pre-row downs and those ones. Yeah. It's that they do it for a whole, whole song. song. No one had done that. It was like Beach Boys. Yeah. Be- Beach Boys, though, it was like, it was that, but it wasn't like the bullshit hippie stuff. It was like. Sure. Yeah, they kind of, yeah, they, it's, they, we're up here with our fur coats. And yeah. And it's the lyrics, it's, it's, the lyrics were like timely for what. Earnest. Yeah, for what people, that post Woodstock generation yeah, were ready Ultimate, for. Yeah, ready. We, they like, wanted we want to get low, easy. It's easy. Meanwhile. Vietnam War. Yeah, meanwhile, fucking, like, I was thinking about this, like, so almost, like, these first world problems, like, four and 20, like, existential kind of, like, mental health problems questioning whether you should or shouldn't cut your hair literally marvin gaze writing what's going on that same year 
you know. Oh, of course. And like, the because fact there's that, like riots. And the fact that Stephen Stills has the guts to put a lyric like to play the blues, you've got to to pay, sing the blues, you've you, got to pay your dues and carry on. Like, unreal. And meanwhile, yeah, exactly. Dude, I fucking Ma- love Marvin Gaye's dude, writing what's going yeah. on. Dude, I fucking I got to be honest, I fucking loved Carry On when I first heard it. <laughs> I couldn't fucking believe it. It was fucking. I mean, my dad. I went into Manchester. Was meeting this girl, and uh, who I really liked. I was. I was like eighteen, uh, and I went. And I went to meet her at this bar called the Temple of Convenience. Actually, it used to be a downstairs Victorian toilet that got converted into a bar. So you went down, kind of like the one in Victory Square, which I've always thought would be a great business to buy that off the city and turn it into a bar. The one you go under. You know, when you go underground into it. Mm, maybe yeah like the dominion building oh yeah yeah okay you buy that and you go there's two entrances yeah and you go under it but inside there's a bar so there's a place in manchester like that and i remember i was going in to meet this girl who you know one time i did too much ecstasy and went and hung out with her and then that was that was the end of that one she didn't want mm-hmm. to hang out with me anymore which is fair enough because i probably looked insane but um, on the way I went to this record store and uh, these things are amazing you know the guy working um, I bought uh, After the Gold Rush that day on vinyl. I knew that record, obviously. And uh, he said, I was still living with my parents. I was probably 17. If you like this, you should buy this. And it was Deja Vu. So, like, I remember, like, getting that and taking it home. And it, like, yeah, being, like, some kind of, like, prismatic flower petal blooming and me even going downstairs and be like dad you gotta listen to this because you know like, you like Neil Young and the patience he must have had with me when I'm playing carry on it's just like some like cocaine like trip through classic rock well it's really more bloated. accessible to a younger yeah, person it is like, and then, I, I didn't like Neil Young until I saw him live really um, w- w- at the bridge school benefit in, in in northern California where I saw Crosby Sills Nash about three times too but you know uh, it was an acoustic concert and i went and and he blew i was i I tried you know i liked harvest maybe sure i tried and i went and paul mccartney was also playing it was an acoustic unbelievable yeah no red hot chili peppers i mean that's really what the peppers the chili peppers peppers dude acoustic sonic youth uh tony bennett bizarre bizarre lineup. lineup and um i remember paul came out and played and he drive my car you know he came out and started and and I was like just loving it, you know, eighteen or something, blown away. And then Neil was gonna f- close the show, yeah. and I remember talking to everybody around and being like, "Who the kind fuck? talking shop? Who the fuck? A little bit of shop talk. Yeah, talking shop." I was like, "Who the fuck does this guy think he is? He's gonna follow one of the Beatles, yeah, you know?" And everybody was like, "No, no, no, it's Neil." And mm-hmm. I'm like, "What, Neil?" And he came out, dude. He had like the eight guitars around him. Yeah. Just sat on Classic the stool. Dad started look. playing Pocahontas. Yeah. Like smacking, smacking the, guitar the guitar to get the. Smack, yeah. Aurora doing that thing. Boria. And man, yeah. you could have heard a pin drop yeah. in that. And I was, I went home and I went to Ditch Records. Yeah. And I bought like seven albums. Man, remember fucking just, listening to After the Gold Rush, like um, Southern Man. Oh, yeah. And, and like the fucking guitar solos in that shit, where you're just like, you don't even know what's going on. It's like I remember, like I was learning. I've been learning guitar for years, like listening to like Johnny Marr or like these proficient guitar players, what? jangly guitar players, and he's just like got this feral energy. Neil's the top S- guitarist top, in my mind. For top, me, electric guitar. Top ten. Top, top number one. He's number one for number you. Number one. Yeah. What number about uh, Tom Verlaine of the Neil Young Pantheon? Wouldn't you say? Uh, he's top twenty. He's in the top twenty. Only top 20? Yeah. Tom Verlaine, I would say. Uh, he's an amazing guitar player. Yeah. I love television. Where's Jerry for you? Jerry's, Jerry's, he's probably number eight or kind so. Of, kind of a, uh, you know, it's funny. We're talking about it. It's kind of hard to not talk about, you know, Van Halen, Eddie. Oh, man. Going. I f- oh, I wish we, well, yeah. Well, we still got time. No, for me, it's it's Neil, George, and Jimmy George. Page. Top three. Yeah, George is my number okay. two. Yeah. Jimmy is good because of Bonham, though, I think. Yeah, but I mean, he's just also insane. They create space. Of course. Yeah. But we could break down the rest of the list another time. But, but Eddie, man. Neil, man. I, you know, I'd, I'd seen that show, and I'd seen 
I'd seen him about four times acoustic, never seen him play an electric guitar. And I went, you know, the one crazy horse came like maybe five yeah. years ago. And I tell you, man, I went and he came out and the sound of that guitar, he just started playing like Love and Only Love from mm-hmm. Ragged Glory. It was like the the power of it cascading through. I started, Fire cr- power. I started crying. Yeah, it's Instantly, a very unique Instantly, it was sound. so powerful, and I was yeah. like, I'd never seen him live yeah. playing. You know, we grew up in an era where we didn't have an access point to, like, because we didn't have the internet. We didn't with a lot of these people. And also, we didn't have, like, MP3s or anything yet. So, like, my experience of Neil Young was restricted to the records that either, A, my dad just owned, or ones that I could find to buy. So, like, my dad, for some reason, had on the beach on vinyl, like, yeah, I see, thought, it took me a long time to discover beach, that shit. I thought On the Beach was like a really, I mean, obviously, like, it's important in a kind of like as a fan and as a deep dive. And it's, a, it's you know, top oh, three for I mean, me. Yeah, it top is. Top three. Yeah, yeah. But it's like. More than that. It, yeah. It, well, what? More like than more three? than just like as a fan or a deep dive. Like, I think it's one of his best records. Top three. Yeah. But, you know, yeah. you could, it's like Zuma or something. It's better than, yeah. Well, Where yeah. It's no, like, it's you like know what I mean. It's What's kind of, that era? Is yeah, it? it is. Yeah. yeah, but it's so it's like. But I thought it was as important. I thought it was as commercially successful as Harvest until right because I had a copy of. Yeah, it. I see. And it's just actually the same with Dennis Wilson, Pacific Ocean Blue. I just assumed <laughs> that this record was. <laughs> I just assumed that this record was you assumed Pacific Ocean Blue was, was like, like as, as big, big as, as Pet Sounds, sounds. yeah, oh because I had God. a copy of it, you know, and you don't get to like you don't album. get to go on the internet and figure out these things. You can get like a Q magazine or whatever and hope that they do like a you know like a monthly special every month. Jesus, on, on. how old are we? And but because of that, also you don't have access to these people like cinematically other than like the last waltz mm-hmm. like or if you had like a bootleg vhs of like a ragged glory or a weld i had a couple dvds of bootleg neil concerts like weld era no yeah no there was a couple mirrorball yeah. mirrorball no, no, there probably there was, was some a few. 70s stuff russ never sleeps stuff. yeah well that and like just like bootleg show like sure. doing like like a hurricane in like 76 in like denmark or yeah. something yeah and th- this stuff was but, so formative, what, you know. Yeah, of course. But what I mean is you seeing him live, it's like you, you've you barely ever seen these people move. Like, it's not yeah. like now. It's like I remember seeing The Last Waltz for the first time. And, like, I'd never actually seen an animated version of Neil Young. You know, I'd never seen, like, someone, like, I'd, I'd heard his music. But I'd never actually seen what he really looked like moving. Yeah. I mean, even though he has a massive rock of cocaine visibly up his nose well and they even try to digitally remove it it, but it's still there but yeah or i mean you don't know what these people look like so when you see them these moments are sort of like truly important to the soul definitely and they're because you've thought about it and you've kind of created up your own narrative of what these people are going to do and be like even hearing their voice like their talking voice well i could tell you when mccartney that night that was special to be in a place with the beetle Oh yeah, and you know when we were leaving the concert, we left. It had finished, and we were walking, and we we were ahead. You know, young guys walking really quickly, and there was all the crowd of people from the concert behind us. And all of a sudden, we hear this scream, and I look back, and a limo is going by, and so I go right out into the street, and go right up to the limo window and wave like that, and then it keeps going. The and the skylight opened. And the hand just waved, no. and it had the wa- the Beatles black watch. I knew it was Paul. The Beatles black watch. You know how Paul always wore like a nice, clean black mm. watch like that. He nah, still does. Oh, I gotta get one now. Yeah, just like a nice thin band. Would it fit with they my wore, he Sopranos like Christopher style? Yeah. Oh, perfectly. Really? Yeah. 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 That would Paul. They all always wore a, a black, a thin band black watch. The Beatles. And Paul did for a long time. They're known for this. And now he does again. Yeah. They're known. He probably for this? went out for it. He got out of it maybe around like the Ram era for a bit when he was kind of a kind farmer. Of more of a farmer. When he was kind a of farmer. Of a, yeah, but definitely yeah. Wings era, he got back into that watch. Yeah. Maybe he just like took a bit of time out when he was on the mole. You know, the yeah. mole, you know, when he was up there, like, didn't I heard that he had actually, I didn't know this, but I think it was Jeff telling me the other day that he had a, 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 a Abbey Road B, the B room rebuilt at his house. 
Okay. On the Mall of Kintyre. Why not? See, you talk about Lindsay Buckingham's bathroom thing. Prince. And this is S- Prince did it with yeah. You know, but that actually makes sense to me. If you're Paul McCartney, yeah, you want to hang out on your farm and you want it to yeah. sound that good. Yeah, yeah. Rebuild the rebuild that room i need to research that because i've never read that i read that he was broke as fuck when he was living up there because like there was like problems with payouts from apple and they were like really worried like i, I might guess, not be able but to whenever pay i hear those stories about rock stars being broke yeah. i'm like okay sure a different kind of poverty though. yeah well a different kind, a different of, poverty, kind you know? of poverty yeah. like, for some it's more of an impossible way of life than others you know um i was thinking like what are you saying? What's the the psychotically line? Yeah. Oh yeah, they're like you, you philosophically, and he's like philosophically. Uh, I forget something and psychotically. I love it. I mean, that sums up. Robbie so Robertson. Much. Yeah. Rob, well, it sums up Robbie Robertson. It'd be good to do like I was thinking. It'd be good to just do like the last Waltz soundtrack on this show. Yeah, we could do that. Yeah. Saturday Night Fever. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it gets, we could get, like, there's four, I mean, people, listen, fans, people listen to the show, if you want to do one of these records with us, if you think you can kind of like, you know, cut the kind of mustard and get in this, you know, get, if you we think can do, you can hack it, if you think you can hack the riff in, yeah. just, just message us and say which records you want to do, we'll get you, we'll do a little test, you know, we'll we, test it out, we we'll do like a five account. minute kind of hazing, Yeah. and if it feels good, we'll, you know, we could get you on, I mean, we're just musicians trying to spread you know the good word the love the love really yeah and you know it's all love it's all love it's uh and all you need is love your favorite song off uh magical mystery tour did i say that i don't know i do like it yeah i don't know you like the ringo ones don't you (laughs) no not on that album the magical mystery tour i like uh fool on the hill a lot yeah. And it's and I really like Hello Goodbye. Fucking love Hello Goodbye. Yeah. Great one for a dance floor. And I mean, like, okay, so those are my two Paul, and then obviously I'm the Walrus and Strawberry Fields are just like off the charts crazy songs. Okay, should we call it? Yeah, sure. Love it, man. See you guys we next time. Twice a week. See you then.